All right, so today's lesson is on Millikan's experiment. Okay, um, I think it's 7.5 in your textbook, or it's lesson 4 of our chapter 7. And it's all about Robert Millikan's experiment. Now, during Millikan's time, we knew about charges. We knew about positive and negative charges, but we haven't quite discovered the electron. Not yet. And Robert Millikan had a very interesting question. His question was, is there some fundamental charge where all charges, all known charges, are simply an integer multiple of that fundamental charge? Well, what do I mean by that? Well, imagine, imagine taking a box, a massless box. Okay, we're going <laughs> to take a massless box, and, and we are going to put one marble inside the box and we're going to weigh it. And then you take any other box and put some random number of marbles into it. And take another box and put some random number of marbles into that one. All marbles are identical. Now if you were to weigh all these different boxes, remember the box itself is massless, what you would determine is that every box, their mass could be simply this box is math with only one marble multiplied by some integer. 1, 2, 5, 7, 10, but not 9.3. That has to be an integer. And so he had the same question, but obviously not with marbles, but with charges. And is there some fundamental charge where all other charges are simply an integer multiple of that fundamental charge? And so he designed this experiment. Now, I'm not going to go through my whole PowerPoint. I'm just going to tell you the experiment, because all I need is this picture right here. This picture is everything. And the PowerPoint just goes over what I'm saying. And it also goes into much further detail than what you need to know or than what's in your textbook. I went a little bit overboard on this PowerPoint. So let's just go over this diagram. I hope you can see my mouse or my cursor on the screen. So this was as an experiment. Here we have an atomizer, which is like a perfume spray bottle. And inside he puts an oil. And then he sprays it so that we get all these little oil droplets here. Okay, and a lot of them will fall through this little hole. Then he will have a radioactive source. Right? And this radioactive source is going to, well, shoot radioactive particles at these ion droplets and will ionize them and essentially give them a charge, ripping away their electrons. Okay, but we didn't know that's what they actually did. All he knew is what it gave them a charge. Didn't know about electrons yet. So he knew how to use this radiation, ionizing radiation, uh, to give these oil droplets a charge. And then, notice that this hole that all these iron, these um, oil droplets fell through is now two parallel plates connected to a power source. And he can adjust that power source to change the potential difference across the plates, essentially changing the electric field strength between the plates. And as he changed it, right, the electric field strength um, provided a force on these charged particles, an upwards force. And if you can get that upwards force to balance the force of gravity, he can actually get those charged particles to levitate. And then he could view those charged particles with a microscope that he attached. And so he can levitate these charged particles, view them through a microscope, and um, he'd make measurements like um, determine the diameter of the oil droplets because he would need to know the radius. And you would need to know the potential difference across the plates when they're actually levitating. Why? Well, let's look at the math here for a bit. If you have an oil droplet, and it has a force of gravity acting down on it, and an electric force acting up. Now, if it's levitating, we know that the system is in equilibrium. So your upwards force of um, electrostatic force completely balances your downwards force of gravity. So we can say 
you take the sum of all forces, set it equal to zero, and rearrange, you can say that Fe equals Fg. Okay, and we know Fe is cube times the electric field strength, and um, sorry, Fe, and Fg is mg. Now I told you epsilon, hard to measure. But between parallel plates, we already derived this equation, where it equals the potential difference between the plates divided by the separation between the plates, and that equals mg. Okay, rearranging to solve for the charge on the oil droplet, we get mgr over the potential difference. Okay, so g he knew. He knew what the value of g was. R he would measure using the microscope. Potential difference he would measure using any type of voltmeter. And mass, mass was a little bit different. What he had to do was then turn off the potential difference so the oil droplet would fall. And as it fell, it would almost instantly reach terminal velocity. And then he would actually measure the speed at which it was falling under terminal velocity. And from that, he can calculate the mass. Now, we're not going in to go into depth into those calculations. I did put them in my PowerPoint, but it involves, of course, air resistance because that's what terminal velocity is all about. And so he would need to know the temperature in the air, the humidity in the air. He had to take very precise measurements on many things in order to determine the actual charge on the oil droplet. Now, once he had the charge on the oil droplet, he did it again for different oil droplets and again and again and again. He did this all day, and then all week, and then all month, and then all year, and for a couple of years. He gathered a lot of data on charges on oil droplets. Why? Well, because in science, you need a lot of data to be able to claim something. And you can't just have 10 pieces of data. But after coming up with all that data, he realized that there is a fundamental charge, which we are going to label E, and it has a value of 1.60, times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Let me just get rid of this Fg here. And we know that's the charge on an electron today. Don't forget, it's also the charge on a proton, just different size, um, signs, but the magnitude is the same. And so we can say the total charge on any object is just an integer multiple of that fundamental charge, where n is simply um, the number of excess or deficit electrons you have on a certain material. And we can say that now because we know that electrons exist, and it's the electrons that either come and go, not the protons. Okay, so that's all I want to talk about for the experiment. We're going to try some of the practice problems. And I did used to have a lab that you would do using Excel. I'm going to try to see if I can get sheets to do it, and maybe we can do it on the Google Classroom. I will try to post that tomorrow. If not next week. And if not, then I couldn't get it to work. <laughs> okay. Um, so first question. On the back it says calculate the number, question number one, calculate the number of electrons that must be removed from a neutral isolated conducting sphere to give it a positive charge of 8 times 10 to the minus 8 coulombs. So that's this equation we're going to work with, Q equals Ne, your total charge, your elementary charge, and the number of excess or deficit electrons. Rearranging, it's N that we want to solve for, so it just equals Q over E. The charge they give us is 8.0 times 10 to the minus 8 coulombs, and the elementary charge 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Put that in your calculator and you get 5 times 10 to the 11. 11 what? No units. These units count. These units cancel. All you're doing is counting. 
Okay, so there's no units to something you're just counting. It's like counting apples, except we're counting the number of... Um, this is a positive charge, so we're counting the number of deficit electrons there are, because there'll be more um, positive charges than negative charges. Okay, not so bad. Let's move on to the second question. Second question says, two large horizontal metal plates, let's draw this, two metal plates, separation distance R of 0 0.05 meters, and we have a small plastic sphere suspended halfway between. The sphere experiences an upwards electric force, and of course a downwards gravitational force. And since it's um, suspended, that means it's levitating in place, so those two forces are equal and opposite. Part A, what's the charge on the sphere? Sorry, the charge on the sphere is 6.4 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. What's the potential difference between the plates? Okay, well, we know that Fe, Fe equals Q epsilon. And epsilon we can rewrite as for parallel plates delta V over R. Now we don't need to write Fe equal to mg because it's the same as gravity because they actually give us Fe in the question. They say the force, electric force is 4.5 times 10 to the minus 15 newtons. So all we need to do is to rearrange this to solve for our potential difference, which is Fe times R over Q. We plug in all of our numbers, 4.5 times 10 to the minus 15 newtons times 0 0.05 meters over our charge, 6.4 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs in our calculator and get about 350 volts. Right, so that's part A. Part B wants to know the mass of the sphere. So this this is where we need to set Fe equal to Fg. That's where it's suspended. Then we know Fe and we know Fg is just mg. So since we're trying to find the mass, just divide both sides by our gravitational field. We get Fe over G. Use G as 9.8. Use Fe as 4.5 times 10 to the minus 15, and you'll get the mass to be 4.6 times 10 to the minus 16 kilograms. Okay. This I will post. Actually, I already have posted it. And I'll post a video. And I will keep you informed on whether or not I can get some sort of lab simulation on the Millikan experiment, because it's pretty cool. Alright, have a good weekend.